Welcome to the Prophecy Course. My name is Matthew Shaner, and I will be your guide on our journey through Bible prophecy. Our mission, should you choose to accept it, will be to lock arms and emerge from this course with a clearer understanding of those tough to grasp passages of prophetic scripture. One thing before we get started. When I say sacred cow, do you know what I mean? A sacred cow is a way of believing or behaving that we hold to be above reasoning, beyond criticism. A sacred cow might be a pet project, our favorite fundraiser, our preferred pastor, or our ironclad view of the end times. A sacred cow might even achieve, dare I say it, idle status in us. Well, this course, it's not really designed to leave your sacred cows intact. It doesn't really matter what seminary you went to, or what armchair theology you subscribe to, or even what your pastor taught last weekend. You don't even need to agree with me. As you approach this course, what you'll need is an open, honest willingness to study the scriptures and hold it all before God. I need you to cry out to our Father for understanding and truth until he gives it to both of us. I don't necessarily have all the answers here, but I know who does. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. James 1, 5. Approach this course with open hands. Or, if I've offended you or triggered you already, Turn back now. It only gets more irreverent from here. Still with me? Let's proceed. Pre-ramble. How to make the most of this study. Our journey through the prophecy course begins with groundwork. Lots of it. We'll discuss what prophecy is, what it's not, call into the light, why we hide from it, and answer why we must confront it. Then we'll establish guidelines for studying prophecy and all of scripture. We'll take a stroll down humility lane to witness some of the great misses in end times predictions. We'll get grounded on the different views and isms of the last days. We'll look at prophetic imagery and apocalyptic expressions to reinforce our understanding of the ancient Jewish record. And then, once all this foundation has been laid, we'll begin to cut into some nice, juicy prophecy. So why all this? Why, why not just dive into the book of Daniel or the Olivet Discourse or maybe the book of Revelation? You see, I have been part of the conversations. I've seen the arguments. I've seen the tears. I've seen how tightly people cling to their beliefs, even when they're dead wrong. When those beliefs are built on a misunderstanding of scripture and fueled by the confident surety of a well-liked preacher, folks will dig in and defend a broken position to their grave or to disillusionment. And I don't want any of that for you. I've been there. Even though I grew up in the church, I was completely blind to the word. Then, after I came to Christ and actually began to study the Bible, I very soon made the unfortunate mistake of teaching error around the end times. I can tell you, the moment that you recognize you misrepresented your king, it is an awful feeling. So I want us to start out slowly. I want you to have a basic understanding of the Jewish idioms the Jewish history, and the heavenly imagery that underpin biblical prophecy. Students who enter into this course with little to no understanding of the prophetic passages may actually find themselves at an advantage over more seasoned students. There will be less for you to unlearn. The goal of this study is to dispel the myths and fear around end times prophecy specifically, but to also gain right understanding around all prophecy wherever we find it in the Bible. Maybe you've heard it said that what you believe about God is the most important thing about you. I believe if we can understand the word better, we will understand our Father, our King, and our Spirit better. Popular questions. Here's a short list of questions when it comes to biblical prophecy. Are we in the end times? What is the mark of the beast? What does 666 mean? Who are the 144,000? Who is the Antichrist? Who are the two witnesses? Will there be a third Jewish temple? What is the abomination of desolation? And when will the rapture occur? What is the battle of Armageddon? 
Who are Gog and Magog? What is the day of the Lord? Who is Mystery Babylon? How do I understand the book of Revelation? Who is the man of lawlessness? Will we see the great tribulation? When will the resurrection occur? What does time, times, and half a time even mean? What is Jesus' millennial reign? What are Daniel's 70 weeks? Are blood moons and eclipses signs of the last days? When will Satan be bound? Wars and rumors of wars? Who are the beast and false prophet? And when is the second coming? Whew. All this can equal a lot of confusion. While we won't be answering all of these questions in this course, we will be answering many of these and more. My goal for this course is to teach you to fish. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search it out. So, search it out we will. All right, enough already. Let's begin. What is prophecy exactly? Simply put, biblical prophecy is a heavenly download about the future, but not necessarily our future. Prophecy may happen through dreams or waking visions and be delivered via angelic or human vessels, even through God himself. At the time it is delivered, true prophecy is a revelation of future events. However, it may not be always easily understood. Prophecy is often delivered via poetic, spiritual, or symbolic language. What are some examples of prophecy in the Bible? Though there are hundreds of prophetic passages in Scripture, here are just a few. Micah predicted the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, Judea, 730 years earlier. Isaiah proclaimed the Lord would give the sign of a virgin birth, a prophecy that found fulfillment about 700 years later. And Zechariah predicted the Lord would be valued at 30 pieces of silver in a payment that would end up with the potters about 587 years before it happened. What prophecy is not? Now that we've briefly covered what prophecy is, I should probably point out a few things that it is not. Prophecy is not always future to us. This should be obvious. However, there are prophecies being regularly taught today as awaiting a future fulfillment that simply are not. Oddly enough, prophecy may not always be something we read to know the future, but to actually better understand the past. For instance, if you believe the prophecies about the first arrival of the Jewish Messiah have been fulfilled, you recognize they're no longer future. They're history. Our charge is to discern where we are in time in relation to the prophecy we're studying. Prophecy is not always fulfilled. Somebody clever once said prophecy is history given in advance. While this sounds good, it's not completely true. It may surprise you that prophecy in the Bible doesn't always come to pass. Several prophecies in the Bible are conditional. A few examples. Consider Jonah's prophecy over Nineveh. He proclaimed their end in 40 days. They repented and God withheld the promised judgment. Second, call these promises or prophecy. Deuteronomy 28 is a collection of conditional blessings and curses that foretell Israel's future. Throughout Israel's history, we see the blessings that encourage them when they walk in communion with the Lord and the judgment that befalls them when they wander and turn after their own ways. Note, Jewish historian Josephus records many of the prophetic curses that we find in Deuteronomy 28 as being fulfilled during the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. A third example of conditional prophecy comes from 1 Samuel 23. After saving Kalah from Philistine raids, David sees his forces could easily fall under siege if they stay within the comforts of the walled Judean city. He turns to the Lord for guidance. Will Kalah stand with David? God confirms Kalah's citizens will indeed hand David and his 600 men over rather than resist Saul's siege. Heavenly insight in hand, David moves on and Saul calls off the chase. Was David's capture at Kalah prophesied? Yes. Was it predestined? No. Finally, Prophecy is not always from God. Much of what's being peddled as prophecy these days would actually result in capital punishment if it was delivered during Israel's days of the Mosaic Law. From declarations of healing and prosperity to national revival and even the election results of world leaders, modern day prophets say all sorts of things that don't come to pass, which means it wasn't God doing the speaking. 
per Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. Why study prophecy? Unfortunately, we need to get clear on whether we should be studying prophecy at all. Some have said, don't bother. From the New Age to the very halls of Christendom, from psychics to megachurch pastors, believers have been taught to actually avoid studying prophecy. Upon receiving a download from her spirit guide, Dwal Cool, New Ager Alice Bailey wrote of a universal Christ in her 1948 book, The Reappearance of Christ. If our work is rightly done, he will come at the set and appointed time. How, where, or when he will come is none of our concern. Our work is to do our utmost and, on as large a scale as possible, to bring about right human relations, for his coming depends upon our work. No, it doesn't, actually. Pastors Rick Warren, Brian McLaren, and Robert Schuller, to name a few, have gone on record saying similar. Here's a quote from Rick Warren's best-selling book, The Purpose Driven Life. When the disciples wanted to talk about prophecy, Jesus quickly switched the conversation to evangelism. He wanted them to concentrate on their mission in the world. He said, in essence, the details of my return are none of your business. What is your business is the mission I've given you. Focus on that. Can you imagine if the disciples had accepted the mindset that prophecy was unimportant? Should the early church have disregarded Jesus' warning of incoming judgment in the Olivet Discourse? Don't know how to answer that question? By the end of this course, you will. Some have said it will be one way or another. Global cooling? No, wait, make that global warming. Nuclear war? Entirely possible. Pandemics, solar flares, planet-killing asteroids, alien invasion, bee extinction, etc. In the West, the curious fascination with death by zombie apocalypse grew to such a pitch through fictional movies and television shows that the U.S. Center for Disease Control even came out with guidance on what to do in the event of a zombie attack. Of course, they were just being playful. But I offer it as further proof that we seem to be in love with dreams of our own demise. Some have said Jesus was wrong. Here's a direct quote from pages 97 and 98 of the book, The World's Last Night, written in 1960. Say what you like, we shall be told. The apocalyptic beliefs of the first Christians have been proved to be false. It is clear from the New Testament that they all expected the second coming in their own lifetime. And, worse still, they had a reason, and one which you will find very embarrassing. Their master had told them so. He shared and indeed created their delusion. He said in so many words, This generation shall not pass till all these things be done. And he was wrong. He clearly knew no more about the end of the world than anyone else. It is certainly the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. The author's name? Clive Staples Lewis. You may know him as C.S. Lewis, the great Christian author who wrote such popular books as Mere Christianity, The Screwtape Letters, and The Chronicles of Narnia. Not only is it important that we study the Word, all of the Word, including prophecy, but it's important that we understand what we're reading. Many confused atheists, Jews, and Muslims have targeted Jesus' words, and Christians, just as confused, have been ill-prepared to defend the faith. Here's a hint. Jesus wasn't wrong. C.S. was. What does the Bible say about studying prophecy? In the Olivet Discourse, Jesus warns his disciples to be diligent. Beside the blessings promised in Revelation, the Bible teaches us we should be recognizing the seasons. Here is some of what the Bible has to say about our call to study and understand prophecy. 
We also have a more sure word of prophecy. Wherefore you do well to take heed as to a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy of old came not by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Paul also wrote, do not despise prophecies. How much of the Bible is prophetic? If we're discounting the prophetic, we may as well throw out God's promises to Abraham, Moses, and Israel. All the books of the prophets, many Psalms, most of the New Testament, including all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all the predictive warnings from the epistles of Peter, Paul, and others. And of course, the book of Revelation. Yeah, so from Genesis to Revelation, about a third of what we call the Bible. In fact, of all the holy books on the earth, including the Muslim Quran and the Hindu Bhagavad Gita, the Bible by far has the most emphasis on the prophetic. In fact, it is this prophetic element that is one of the primary reasons we can be sure that the Bible is the infallible word of God. Here are some key statistics we can use to make the case for studying prophecy. 108. It is said that there are 108, or at least over 100, prophecies Jesus fulfilled at his first coming. 1 to 8. For every one prophecy about the birth of Christ, there are eight about his second coming, meaning 318. According to the one count, there are 318 New Testament references to Jesus' second coming. 23 out of 27. 23 out of 27 New Testament books contain prophecy. Stop. To my note takers, put your pens down. Oh, wait. Don't put your pens down. Use your pens to cross out those numbers you just faithfully wrote down. These stats are likely wrong. If we don't understand what we're reading, we have little idea as to whether or not a prophecy is past, present, or future. There is a gobsmacking amount of error around end times prophecy and the Messiah's return. But boy, do we love our stats. The question then is this, do we know what we're reading? Therein lies the rub. When we fail to understand the ancient Jewish idioms because we're reading them through our modern Greek Gentile lenses, we end up doing damage to the text. We allegorize passages that were meant literally, and then we literalize passages that were meant allegorically. The fruit of that is error, which damages the flock and the church's reputation before this lost and dying world. Well-intentioned, overzealous believers have been wildly wrong about their end times estimations and have ended up looking like nuts to non-believers. And in that, we don't need any help. We believe some crazy stuff already. Benefits to studying prophecy. Dialing into WIIFM, as in what's in it for me, let's take a look at what kind of benefits we get out of sacrificing our time, our energy, and our gray matter to study out the Word of God. Beyond the blessings of revelation, beyond Jesus' own example, beyond his admonition and our obedience, let's see what other benefits there could be to studying prophecy. Prophecy deepens our understanding of God. When we rightly understand our Father, it encourages repentance and deepens relationship. Right understanding builds intimacy with Jesus. If we recognize Jesus is the Word made flesh, would we ever say to him, oh, that's okay, we don't need to know that part of you, Lord. We believers are called to hear and declare the whole word of God. Prophecy deepens our understanding of God, his plan, and our place in it as sons and daughters. Prophecy comforts us and increases our trust. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Through right understanding of the prophetic passages, the early church 
understood and navigated the tribulation and persecution of their day. As we grow in our understanding of the word, we deepen in our trust of God's promises and of his warnings. Prophecy prepares us for what lies ahead. Surely the Lord will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. In Amos 7, God warns Israel of day in the Lord's sized judgment coming to them from the hands of Assyria. God certainly warns his people of incoming judgment, but as Daniel 12.10 affirms, the faithful are often tested. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Understanding prophecy helps the believer navigate the tribulation of their time, whether that's personal or corporate. Prophecy strengthens our evangelism. There are folks who reject Jesus as a false prophet because they misunderstand his words. If we believers don't understand what we're reading, how can we properly represent our king and his teachings to this fallen world? Without right understanding, we will certainly be less effective in defending the faith and declaring the hope that is in us. Prophecy strengthens our apologetics and equips us to better evangelize. Why we avoid prophecy. Now let's cover some common reasons why we avoid prophecy. We've been taught evangelism is more important than prophecy. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Is evangelism important? Absolutely. But many have reduced prophecy to such a degree so as to declare it unimportant. And yet, if it's all God's word, understanding our Lord's words is vital if we're going to evangelize properly. Prophecy is too hard to understand. We're forced to wrestle with prophecy, and sometimes wrestling can be uncomfortable. Books like the Prophets or Revelation can be rife with symbolism, forcing us to slow down to take our time, and to tease out truth. It can take years to study out all the history and all the views before you actually land on the truth. And who's got time for that? Can't we just watch a video or something? We're just plain chicken. We're afraid of it, especially end time prophecy. We've heard about the fire and brimstone of the last days and we are quite fine looking the other way. But wait, end times error is profuse, so don't worry about it. Much of what we believe about the end times is probably wrong anyways. Conclusion. So it's important we get this right. Prophecy matters. If our Father's word matters, a priority on rightly understanding and discerning his word should be included in our study. Let me be bold and say it must be a top priority. And so study and rightly divide we will even when it becomes uncomfortable. Liberties taken with the prophetic word have resulted in modern Bible teachers and students writing themselves into the word where we don't belong and writing ourselves out of the word where we do. These false beliefs can lead to a misplaced heartache, anxiety, terror, callousness toward evangelism, and lazy stewardship of our resources if we live as if the end is imminent daily when Christ admonished us to remain faithful and wise until he returns. Prophecy is absolutely important enough for us to wrestle with. Remember, it's the truth that sets you free.